I don't want to give anybody the sloppy version of Amelia. I want to give my highest and best self because it's going to repeat, right? Whatever experience you have of me will repeat. So when you start to realize it's not my impact I'm having on you, my impact on you affects your team. Right. It affects your clients. Right. It affects your business. It affects the area. It, it, I have a huge impact. Welcome to the I Own It Podcast with Ben Reinberg. We're live from the Ben Reinberg's I Own It Studios today in Laguna Beach, California. And we just keep rolling out incredible, talented women every single week. And today's guest is no exception. Amelia Antonetti, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank what a you. pleasure to have you in California. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's so cool. It's so cool. So I was hoping we could start talking about one of your books, which I recently got a copy of, is Designing Genius, which was published late last year. And I have two questions I wrote down I wanted to ask you. Why is it that so many people have the wrong ideas of how to lead their best life? Well, most people are conditioned to think it's outside, right? We, we look towards, you know, I'm going to get a degree. I'm going to go get a job. I'm going to, like, everything is outward focused. You know, even some people, you know, hope that somebody's going to come and save them, right? I'm going to meet the man of the dreams or woman of my dreams. It's outside of self. And success has been proven time and time again. It doesn't matter at what level of success. It's an inward journey. Um, and inward is normally where people don't want to go because it hurts. So instead, they keep trying to collect things from outside of themselves, trying to build a life, but yet it never feels sticky. It never feels successful. Um, and that's why. It's because you're looking, you're being trained and conditioned that it's an outward source. It's money. It's love. It's whatever. It's out there. And I'm like, eh, it's in here. <laughs> So once you solve in here, what can people expect? So it, it, it what it does from a behavior standpoint is it creates the 100% 100%. So there's this crazy myth, right, that, you know, it's 50-50, mm -hmm. right? I'm 50%, you're 50%, together we make a whole. And I was like, uh, that is the framework of dysfunction, right? It's 100%, right? You can't, you can't share in something that you don't have, right? So it's about being 100% responsible for your own happiness, for your own fulfillment, for your own purpose, for all of your, uh, you know, financial stability is all your 100% responsibility. And then you can share that, but you can't share something that you don't have the capacity for. So if you have, you know, like self-love, right, from zero to five, if you can self-love at a two, that means I can only love you to a two. Right, it's building the capacity within that enriches your ability with others because we have to, we have a need to belong, right? We have this need, but we keep thinking it's outward, right? That if you have more capacity, then somehow I'm gonna get it. And it, that's not how love works. That's not how conditioning, that's not how any of that works. It works from an inside journey and that's what makes it so difficult. So generally speaking, people blame others, mm -hmm. the spouses, relationships, significant others, bosses, you name it, yep. because they haven't mastered their inner game, their own self-love, mm -hmm. and, and that way they can't receive the love either. And so it becomes a challenge for them. So they keep going round and round in circles, looking for something and saying, because I always say, you know, happiness is if you could build it internally, yeah. your whole environment will change. A hundred percent. And it's a, you know, when we talk about energy and frequencies, right, it's about being able to give, mm -hmm. right? You know, to be, you know, we feel such gratification when we give and give freely right, right. without any expectation. Right. But we have to be able to receive with the exact same frequency as we are giving. And so a lot of people are really good givers and they're horrible receivers. And what they don't understand is they're cutting off the infinity loop by my knee not being able, right, to receive uh, lovingly, right, gratefully, to receive with healthy energy. That means I'm creating the break, the distance between you and I. So even though people crave belonging, right, they create, crave the sense of community, their actions, their actual behavior is breaking that. And then they don't understand because they're like, well, I give, I give, I give, I give, I give. And I'm like, the problem is not in your giving. The problem is in your receiving. No, receiving without feeling guilty, receiving without thinking, well, maybe I wasn't worthy, receiving without the same abundance of energy as you give with, right? And so just from a very fundamental uh, level, people give and they have expectations and i'm like well that's not the definition of giving right they don't know how to give freely right they're they're trying to keep score like what do i get in return i'm like well then you didn't really give 
right? You were trading. That's a different thing, trading this for that versus just giving. And so these concepts that allow us to really create the substance within, right? That really this deep substance, this deep presence um, that you know it when you're around it, right? You know, like, wow, that person is solid. Well, because they've done the inner work, right? It's the inner work. And what they're doing is they're sharing their time. They're sharing their love. They're sharing their knowledge. It's not that weird pull from them of like, you know, if you've ever been with somebody like who's an energy vampire, right. like afterwards you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so exhausted, right? Because you feel like you've been sucked dry, right? It's not really this dance of giving and receiving. But when you see that, when you see, you know, two colleagues, two equals in this energetic dance where neither one of them need anything from each other, right? But they so enjoy the experience. It's an experience of wanting an exchange and it's like a dance. And that's really where we're trying to get is to dance with others in a way that there isn't neediness, right? That feeling that just is heavy so it's, around. it's giving a referral giving a gift giving knowledge without expecting anything in return because it feels good you're receiving the gratification from others and that's the gift that people give yeah, you the truly authentically right? right you know when somebody is like wow i really love what you do uh -huh. right and i want to share it it's not because i asked you to right you're genuinely saying i want to share this because i got value well that's the greatest energy in the world to put out there right not a having to sell right because if i serve you right to my fullest ability and you have a beautiful experience then i don't have to like i don't have to do that because organically we like to talk to other people about how are we growing and how are we developing and what you know what is useful what's not useful and so if that is a natural message you know a, an exchange from one person to another you actually are in your greatest flow state you could possibly be in because you're not having to push anything right and so when we're talking about you know how do i develop how do i develop teams how do i develop a company you can't push push energy doesn't create scale right? It's actually attracting it in, right? It's the same thing with your team. Your team is trying to attract in, in order for them to be able to develop to their highest and best self. But when we're conditioned to tell somebody, tell somebody, tell something, which is repeating our childhood, right? Good, bad, go to your room, right? The telling, the telling, nobody grows in that environment. I always say that, you know, nothing good grows in toxicity. And so if you're using behavior that isn't healthy and nurturing and growing, you're not going to grow anything. Right. It's who you surround yourself is so important. So important. So let's say you're giving. Basically, you're saying, look, don't expect anything in return. Do it because of the gratification you receive. But also, I think a lot of people, especially with significant others or girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever, they're giving to get something. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a purpose behind the giving. Instead of doing it naturally and not expecting anything in return, and I think that's what creates expectations and people have resentment towards others because if I give you a gift, let's say you give a girl a gift and you're expecting sex in return and you don't get it right. or you don't get a date, right. you, you resent her. Right, because the giving wasn't actually an act of giving, mm -hmm. right? It was a trade. Right. You know, Bob Berg, I think better than anybody else, talks about the go giver, right? That giving, if that is part of your identity, if it's who you are, if you actually are getting true pleasure and enjoyment in the act itself, that organically, right, that authentically is part of who you are, right? Versus trying to do something like to pretend to be somebody or to get something. Those energies are so different and when you hear something and people are trying to mimic it, it's not, it's not organic, right? You have to be able to go, am I, am I that person? Where do I have my area of genius, right? So, you know, for me, human behavior, people problems, like that, that is my area of expertise. And so I do it naturally because I enjoy it. I love being able to help somebody just to tweak their perspective, right? Or tweak what's really going on to unlock them to actually connect better. So it's just, hard I could I can't stop doing it and so when I I'm giving in that area all I want is the 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 joy of the fact that you're like oh wow I never saw it that way oh wow I didn't realize there was a tool for that or like I can I can be closer with other people and I'm like yes right I, I'm just unlocking a skill providing a tool but I don't expect anything in in return it's just 
how I'm designed. It's kind of like who I am. Now, when I want to move on to it, like I want to expand myself, right, to be able to say, okay, I want to be able to, you know, give more or develop myself further, then I'm practicing another act of kindness. But it has to be rooted in, well, why am I doing this? Like, what is the purpose of me being kind? And so, you know, I go, oh, well, the reason why I'm trying to do kindness is there's such negativity in the world, right? I'm trying to counterbalance how life feels for so many people. So when I'm in a situation, you know, I was, I was, I, I was at Starbucks um, and I went to pull into a, 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 a slot, you know, and a guy lost his mind. He was like, that's mine. I'm like, no, worries. I didn't see you. No worries. I'm, I'm happy, right? To be able to take a situation and just diffuse it because we live in such chaos energy that we're hurting, you know, our brothers and our sisters. And so as I expand from like, this is my area of genius, then the next thing I'd like to do is like, I would like to develop my kindness. And I'm like, okay, how do I first be kind to myself? So I can recognize it. How do I be kind to me? And then I go, oh, now that I know that, how do I be kind to you? And then how do I be kind to the next person? And then how do I be kind in a situation that doesn't seem like it deserves kindness, right? It's because you choose that that's how you want to show up in the world. But all of those things are a choice. And so many people are trying to run to catch up with their life as if they had no control. And I'm like, but every single moment is a choice. Every single moment's a choice because you have to choose to participate. So if somebody is arguing, you're choosing to engage in the argument because if you choose not to argue, there's no argument, right? If you choose not to be part of somebody's chaos, then, it, then you're not part of the chaos. If you don't take the call, right? You're not part of it. And so we have to pull back control to be so much more intentional of what is part of our journey and what are you saying doesn't work for me? No. Well, isn't that always a challenge? Like, do you encourage people to slow down? Yes. Slow things down. Awareness. You'll, you, awareness. And let's talk about awareness because I've learned it in spades the last handful of years how important it is. Mm -hmm. Explain to our audience, everyone, awareness and, and what it really means and, and how do you... How do you become more aware? I think what happens is life is moving so fast. We're making decisions. We're on our phones. We're on technology. We're traveling. We're doing this, this, this. I want to grow financially, this and this. We're never slowing down. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we're not aware of our conversations. How is Amelia contributing to me? Mm -hmm. So explain awareness and what that really means to you. Right. So for a good majority of people, uh -huh. right, when you have a feeling, let's say your feeling is feeling depressed or you're feeling a little down, right? Or you're a little bit in like the shadow. Mm -hmm. That is the indicator that your thoughts, your mind is in your past. Anything that feels heavy or negative, right? Or, or saddening, depressive, means you're thinking about what already happened. You're behind. When you're feeling anxious or triggered, your mind is in the future, which means neither of those are present. And so, when your brain naturally goes to wherever your habit is, right, history or future, it's about the skill set of coming into presence, coming back to neutral, into where are you right now? And that is just a practice because a lot of us live in our past or live in our future. And so that is the first act is to be able to come into presence to say, am I aware right now of my surroundings? Like, am I, is my brain here in what's going on? Because being able to pull present means then you are start to become aware of the choices. So when you come to pull present, right, and you say, okay, I actually don't like what's happening right now, or why am I here, right? It allows you to say, wait a minute, I'm gonna make a decision. I don't wanna be here. I don't wanna participate, so I'm gonna remove myself. You know, or that doesn't feel good. Like that energy of that bickering over there doesn't feel good. So I'm gonna pick up and just move. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I may be somewhere and something is going on. I'm like, eh, that does not feel good. Whatever's going on over there. I move myself. We are so conditioned to think that we have to stay, right? We forget that we have choices, right? Choosing, making choices because we go, oh, but I have to because of whatever the noise is. I'm like, you don't have to do anything, right? It's a choice, right? And so that's where we have to really lean into. So we're designing our life right? So the speed and pace of your life currently is your choice. You designed it that way, right? You can very easily put a little bit of space between your meetings, put a little bit of space, right? If that's what you need, if your pace needs a reset, a reset, 
then you give yourself that 10 minutes to reset before you come in, just to be able to say, okay, what's my intention on this next Zoom call? What is my intention as I go to grab a cup of coffee? Like, what is it? You know, when you get dialed into, I try to always uplift the energy of wherever I am. If I can just bring it up a notch, just mm. a little bit happier, a little bit easier, a little bit more flow. And so that's how I kind of maneuver around the world. And when I feel like I can't, is when I ha no, I have to pause. I have to pause and reset, or I have to pause and take a you know a five minute little meditation, or I go, you know what, I don't feel right my best ability as I'm approaching this, so I'll reschedule it, right? Because I don't want to give anybody the sloppy version of Amelia. I want to give my highest and best self because it's going to repeat, right? Whatever experience you have of me will repeat. So when you start to realize it's not my impact I'm having on you. My impact on you affects your team. Right. It affects your clients. Right. It affects your business. It affects the area. It, it, I have a huge impact. And so being intentional to say, I am not at my best to serve you in this moment, and I think it's in our best interest that we reschedule, right? Because I don't want to do sloppy work, right? Because I'm in control of it. But if you don't have the awareness, then you're making decisions by default, right? No decision is the decision. And that's most people's life is they're plowing through their day. They're exhausted at the end. And they're just like, I don't know if I can do this for the next 25 years of my life. I'm like, because you're not designing it, you know? And it starts with not adding more. It's about deleting. It's doing less. Because most people's calendars, when I do an audit of their calendar, mm -hmm. 60 to 70% of what is on their calendar has absolutely nothing to do with where their desired destination is. Nothing. It's busy work. Because people think being busy is productive. It's success. It's not. Right. Right? The but most people, successful people are not busy. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So your book discusses your life story and how you became the behavior guru you are today, which I've seen live, which is really impressive <laughs> for everyone out there. Share some of that context with the audience to kick off. Like, how did you become who you are today? I mean, you're a young girl, you're growing up, you're Jewish, you're Italian, and now you're this incredible, talented lady that people desire because I always say your personal life and business life come together. Sure, yeah. And so explain to everyone, like, how did this develop for you to well, become this expert in you what know, you do? I, so I've always wanted to be a, a creator. I always wanted to build, like since I was little, 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 like, you know, um, you know, I was the one who had all the Girl Scouts, you know, in my garage with the whiteboard as so I was like, okay, here's how we're going to win the thing. You know, so I've always had this, this desire to like build teams. It's, it's, I've always been that one, like people naturally would follow me because I love that responsibility in that role. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like just in me. And so building a company, even though when I started it, there wasn't women doing what I was doing. It's very odd. Like people thought there was something wrong with me. They're like, just get married. And I was like, but I want to build a business. People were like, what? You know? Um, and so this, you know, it was before Oprah and Martha Stewart and Sarah Smith, before all, the, all that, you know, mm -hmm. I had this kind of desire to do that. And when I started building it, where my team started to get, you know, more than, you know, a dozen or so people, I really realized like, wow, like, I can't do this without people. <laughs> like you can't build a business without people. And I was one of those people who tried to do everything and I was a control freak and I didn't delegate well. And I started like this aha moment going, wait a minute, the company is only as successful as my ability to develop and exchange my knowledge with my team. Like that's, that's my role. My role is to serve and fully develop them. My role isn't the customer. My role is the team. And then the team serves the customer by repeating the knowledge. And right. And I was like, okay, well, where is it? Where is it located that tells us how people grow? How do they grow? How do they develop? How do they start to realize that what they learned to survive their childhood actually doesn't suit them for today? And no matter where I was looking, you know, I've had a lot of things in therapy, but I was like, there's not a system. I'm like, where's the system that allows somebody to move from here to there that says, this is what you're going to have to walk through. This is what you're going to have to make peace with. This is what you have to let go. This is a new skill you've never seen that you have to learn, right, to get where I wanted to go. And I kept finding nothing. So I was like, okay, let me figure it out just for my own team, right? What is it 
that they're doing when they're not here. That was my very first step. I just want to know, okay, when you're not working here for me, what is happening in your lives? And so, and I had this honeydew pot. So everybody was telling me like, you know, I'm doing laundry and I'm cleaning houses and I'm, we're mowing lawns and we're rotating tires on the car. We're doing these chores. Um, and I was like, okay, what I started to realize was my approach to solving problems was nothing like theirs. Like I'm like queen of efficiencies, right? And I was like, wow. So I have all of my employees doing the same thing individually. Well, that doesn't make any, like I love systems. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take one thing and I'm going to solve it from a CEO's mindset, right? So the first one was all the stuff that has to happen about cars, right? Mm -hmm. um, rotating tires, checking oil, like all that stuff. But I don't understand anything about it, but I understand enough to make a business proposition to say, if I've got 200 cars that need to be serviced, you come to me. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is I'm going to negotiate, right? So now instead of it being 40 bucks, right, it was 10 bucks. They didn't have to leave the office and it didn't suck up two or three hours of their time. And people are like, oh my God, that's genius. And I'm like, well, not really. It's what we do, right? We're negotiating a contract. It's what we do as business owners. So I was like, okay, well, what's the next thing, right? And so what I started to do was solve their problems that to me was not a problem, right? And helping them come together with this concept of being efficient, which allowed them to be aware of, well, what am I trying to accomplish? See, most people go into something by default. And so the first thing I did was stopped my team to say, what's the desired outcome? What are you trying to accomplish? Instead of burning through your weekend and then saying, oh, I didn't have any time to myself. Well, was that the goal? Was, was the goal to replenish yourself? Because if the goal was to replenish yourself, none of those activities aligned with it. And so I started teaching these concepts about human behavior, about how to get what it is that you desire. Right. And by moving things around and calendar management and all that type of stuff. And so that's what started to unfold. And so I created basically at 53,000 employees, right? I've created a system that all of the problems that pop up inside of a business to solve the problem behaviorally with a tool. And then what I started to realize was the same problems that I was teaching and developing inside the organization, that behavior also shows up in your personal life. Right? The way you do one thing is the way you do everything. People, it wasn't a lack that they didn't want more out of life. Like everybody I've ever met wants more out of life. The problem is you're like, okay, define more. What, what does more look like? Right? They, well, I want to be successful. Well, what does that mean? Right? We speak in such general terms that we're not very specific. And so by creating the playbook, somebody starts to realize that when they create what is a perfect day, moment by moment, right? Step by step. What do you see when you wake up? What do you hear? Are you listening to the ocean? Is there somebody there? Is there a dog? Is there not a dog? Is there a significant other? Is there coffee? There's no coffee. What is the room? What's the color of the room? Like all of these details, walking somebody through the exercise so they actually paint what really is matters to them if this was the last day on earth. And what people come to the immediate aha is that they are living some percentage of that perfect day. It's never zero, it's 10% or 15% or 20%. So I'm like, okay, let's move the needle. Let's just do, right, 1% better every day. Let's do one thing that's gonna move closer to more of a perfect day. And people start to get inside the experience and go, wait a minute, I have control. I'm like, yes, you don't have to live by default. You can control how life feels and how life grows by understanding where you are to where you wanna go and which one of these behaviors need to move in that direction and which one you have to say, I am so glad I learned this behavior. It got me to today, but this current behavior will not get me to where I wanna go, which means, well, what do I do with it, right? Most people don't go through the process of understanding what happens when you have to release a behavior right, to look at your own reflection and go, this way that I respond is not creating the relationships of where I wanna go. And so, especially people who are overly anxious, right, they don't realize that their anxious energy creates distance in relationships because it's exhausting. It right. doesn't feel exhausting to you because that's your norm. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's exhausting when you throw it over on somebody else's side. Right. So we walk them through on how to quiet 
that noise of what isn't theirs anymore to actually serve it back to the original owner. And most of us are walking around with energy and thoughts and beliefs that are not ours. And we haven't been given the tool to rightly serve that back to who it belongs to. It's not yours. Do you feel that money and society and social media paints this picture where people aren't living their perfect day because they're chasing money, okay? So they're, they're giving up, they're sacrificing their perfect life, their, their playbook, mm -hmm. so to speak. Do you find that that's a common root element of it's money, it's the pressure of society, it's competing with the Joneses. All these things are these outside forces that are constantly circling us that impact decisions we make in our behavior. Yeah, so um, I love collectors. That's what we call them, right? Okay. People who collect stuff. Right. And so it's like a big hungry monster. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. planes, trains, automobiles, women. But they collect all this stuff and they're like, why am I still hungry, right? right? Because the more they collect, the more dissatisfied they am. So it's it's actually an addict's right addiction right we all have a way that we self-medicate right some people self-medicate by collecting some people self-medicate by shopping some people self-medicated by sex drugs alcohol working somehow you quiet your pain and you self-medicate and whatever the vice is it doesn't matter about the vice mm -hmm. it's the behavior That's the right. behavior of self-medicating is what is so dangerous mm -hmm. because you try to mask it and you try to mask it and you try to mask it but what happens is the loneliness the pain that that draw that pulls down on you right gets so heavy where you're like i can't get out of i cannot do one more day right. i can't do one more day because the pain is growing right it doesn't go away Right there's there's a process about how to be able to understand what your pain is, witness your pain, which is what most people want. Most people want to just a witness that the pain is real, right? Not to solve it. People don't want you to jump over there and give you them advice. They want to you to be a witness. I am in pain. To be able to say yes, you are an enormous amount of pain. What do you need from me right now? Right? I'm not going anywhere. What do you need for me now, right now? And most people don't know what they need. They just sit in pain and it just grows. And so these are where the behavior becomes so important because instead of us helping people relieve that pain and heal that pain, we teach them to mask it, right? We teach our children, stay busy, stay busy, do another sport, do good in school, stay busy, not to lean into it and say, okay, wait a minute. There's something something here, right? Because that's the awareness that allows us to go into self-healing and self-soothing that isn't toxic. And so we have to be able to find a healthier tool, right? Because we're still gonna self-medicate. That's just an instinct to say, okay, what I'm gonna do instead of collecting a car or a woman or whatever, I am going to meditate. I'm going to give myself a sense of peace. And that peace happens to be getting quiet, filling my mind, taking care of my body, but whatever your practices are, is your form of self-medication that you start choosing healthy. But it has to start becoming a ritual and a routine because you're not trying to heal from one day of pain. It's for however long you've been carrying it, right? So our root damage, right, is what repeats forever in our life. And that's the lesson is to understand, wait a minute, this is on my side, mm -hmm. right? What I'm feeling right now, this is on my side, right? So that we can have healthier relationships, right? So if I'm triggered by something that you do, right? You don't know what the trigger is. You just right. know something was weird, right? right. Millie's being weird, right? For me to go, hey, listen, I'm triggered right now. You know, I'm triggered because of my abandonment issues. And so just give me a second for me to center because I don't want you to have to take it. It's not your responsibility, right? Or for me to be able to lean in and say, listen, what I, what I really, need from you right now is I need to know that, you know, you're going to go to wherever you're going and that you're coming back, right? I just need that reassurance that you're coming back. Now to you, you may go, well, that seems weird. Why do you need that? It doesn't matter why I need it because we have a relationship. You honor the ask, right? To say, oh yeah, just I'll let you know that I'm, I'm coming back, right? As I'm working through it, that's a way for you to be supportive. It's not for you to solve it for me, right? Because if you solve it for me, you are hurting me. You are robbing me from the journey of me being able to take care of myself, right? So when people have hero syndrome that they want to jump over and save somebody, I'm like the damage you are doing to not only them, but to you. 
because the cycle when you try to rescue is always going to end with bitter, angry, and resentful, right? I'm going to resent that you try to rescue me because how dare you? It implies I can't take care of myself. So it's only a matter of time before that happens. But when we get into relationships dysfunctionally from the beginning, by thinking I'm gonna get something for you that's going to fix over here, we're fucked, right? We have to be able to go, wait a minute, how are you coming into this and being honest with the work that you're doing so I can be supportive? Right? I wanna be able to support your journey and you have to understand the work that I'm doing so that you can be supportive, that we don't unintentionally trigger each other. But if you do trigger each other, what is the plan? Don't try to, uh, try to move through something when you're both triggered because neither one of you are present, you're in your history, to be able to say, okay, when we're triggered, here's the protocol we're going to follow. No different than a business. When there's conflict in a business, what's the protocol? What's the process that we lean into because our emotions are lying to us, right? Same thing in a personal relationship. Your emotions are lying to you. Your emotions are saying, oh, you know, he's cheating and he's horrible and he's awful and he's spending all my money and I'm gonna end up, you know, pushing a shopping cart with my kid. Like, none of that's true, right? But you're triggered, so that's where you go. In a work environment, right, people are triggered and they're like, oh, so you're trying to get me fired, right? You, you're trying to make sure that your work is better than my work. Like, you start telling yourself a story like, None of that's actually happening. None of that is actually happening. And so you have to have the systems and the processes for people to work through conflict because conflict is always going to happen, always, mm. right? But we don't have these conversations. We don't have them with our family. If you have a family and you have kids, what is the protocol for handling conflict? Where do we go? Where do we sit? What's the starter? What's the communication? How do we measure if it's working for all parties? Like, you know, we have things, we have tools. We have something called a conflict corner. And we set them out up in the houses. We set up up in businesses because that becomes the rules of the game when this thing hurts or feels bad. And it shows somebody how to resolve conflict because 99.9% .9 people don't know how to resolve conflict. What they do is they avoid it, right? Or they spew, you know, you're just trying to hurt me. And so we have to work on ourselves and how we relate to other. And that's what development is all about. Oh, it's fantastic. So when you start working with a new client, how do you approach diagnosing the people problems in a way that, so it's not superficial, mm -hmm. but it gets a deep understanding of the individuals, their personalities and goals, and also the business itself, including skill sets, processes, and incentives and other things that can contribute to people problems? Yeah, it's a great question. So I would say 100% of the time so far, uh, when I get invited into a, a client's world, um, they think they know. They already tell me, this is what the problem is, I'm gonna tell you about all what's going on, and he here, here it is. And so far, they've never been right. They've never been right. What they think is happening is never what's happening. And even when I work with a seasoned CEO who's like, listen, I've worked with these people for you know, 20, 30, 40, I know them, I, they're part of my family, they're the godparents of what, whatever, like I know them. And I'm like, I promise you that the, mirror, the minute I mirror for you their behavior and where it's rooted and what it really means is nothing that you know. And it's always shocking. So because I'm always working with my colleagues, you know, CEOs, you know, or, um, you know, a VC that's looking to acquire something, right? The first thing they're looking at is the management team. So I can tell you, 100% <laughs> I can tell you whether this team can do that goal. I mean, it's so obvious once you learn how to decode. Um, and so when I'm coming into that situation, what I need to do very quickly, because normally it's an alpha dog, right? That's, you know, not, that's usually what I'm faced against. And I'm like, listen, this is how easy this is going to be. We're going to do your playbook. If I don't show you at least three things about yourself that you don't go, hmm, I had no idea. Like, oh, yeah, you're right. Like that, if that doesn't happen, you don't have to pay me anything, right? Because once I help them see their own reflection and root down the very specific things that they need to get to the next level, right? we require people and a lot of times we mislead our people with what we say we need but it's not really what we need and so you feel frustrated that you're not getting that momentum you know or set up for the for the tipping point mm -hmm. right because everything is a part of an experience and so you know especially people who are trained in sales they don't understand that the easy knocking over the dom domino is if all of these touch points right were 
in harmony, right? That we're in, in synchronicity in order for the salesperson to tip it over. If not, that's why the salesperson has to keep reselling and reselling and reselling to push to the close. But the pushing to the close, even though the act happened, there's always this like lingering kind of like, I wonder if that was the right decision versus having it where they're excited, right? And now anticipating into the onboarding process. And so that's where I start. I start with an executive and I'm like, let me show you where the resistance is in your life and let me show you where you're not building capacity. And if I can't do that, we don't even need to talk about the executive team. But once they experience it, then they're like, wait a minute, I'm ha that's the, then the minute they go, aha, then they're like, oh, you know, I have this person on my team that I was always wondering about. And I'm like, okay, there you go, right? So now I go there and I'm like, let me now show you what's really happening with that individual. And they're always like, wow, get, because it's not what they thought it was, right? And so it just allows me to kind of go deeper and deeper within the organization so that everybody is on the same page of their mirror, because now they understand their roles and their responsibility that they're contributing right to the output which is the, the right they, they was like oh my god i always thought it was you <laughs> I, didn't right. realize, I didn't realize where i was competing right and then we take right then we start doing the matching part of it and saying well if this is this person's like core energy they put in the world it's the thing that people say about them everybody who knows them says the same thing about them right so let's say the word is reliability and then you look at the role you have them in and then you go okay how does reliability have anything to do with this role? And you're like, oh, it actually doesn't. And you're like, they're in the wrong role, right? They've learned just because you're good at something doesn't mean that's where you're supposed to be. It doesn't create the scale that the company needs. The company needs somebody's area of innate genius, the thing that they'll notice and see in that role that nobody else will see to be able to surface that up to the decision maker. But if they don't, if they're not in the right role, you never get to see it. Right. And everything kind of just feels heavy, just it doesn't quite go. And so we play these games. We play a game, you know, we pass a baton and people go, oh, wow, they have no idea <laughs> where they needed to go. Or you can start to see where the energy of the handoff between the different department is so chaotic that you go, that's why it's so stressful here. So we play the behavior games that for the people participating or the CEO who's observing, it immediately pinpoints oh my gosh this is so obvious and that's what they people pull back they're like oh my god the simple exercise has just told me exactly what's happening in my company i'm like yeah every day over and over and over again so that now you understand where there has to be a system but if you can't see it or experience it you just know something's happening up there but you can't really experience the highs and lows that it takes as it things move throughout the company and that's your job of a people officer or a heart officer or experience officer we train those officers in human behavior and show where all of these stuck points happen as one person bumps against another person even though they have great intentions the handoff is not really what's happening right? Doesn't really identify the individual needs, like what you need versus what I need. And that's why the outcomes are nowhere near what we predicted, right? But as a business owner, right, there's two things that are massively important. The more capacity the business has, right, the stronger your internal margin is, the more ability you have to scale. Without capacity, you ain't going anywhere. And without understanding how does every individual on your team build capacity. It's not the same for everybody. And then what happens when I put certain people together that creates that unbelievable, right, push of capacity, because that's really what you're doing, strain and recovery all day long. And so the behavioral tools is what gives all those measurements so that you can properly figure out what the resources are in order for you to hit the next goal. Does this team have the capacity to hit that goal? So I imagine some of the people problems stem from bad leadership or management. What kind of leadership issues do you see? What kind of issues do you see most often with leadership? And how do you approach communicating your perspective, giving leadership is also the person paying you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that number one thing that, you know, I think leaders generally have good intentions, right? I think that the part of the reason why we become business owners and entrepreneurs and we become leaders is we generally want to make the world a better place for our people. We, that's a genuine thing. That's part of all of us. But where things go a little nuts is that there's this thing I'm trying to hire myself, right? I'm looking for somebody like me. And I'm like, okay, 
you're already off to the wrong start, right? Because you actually don't want somebody like you, right? So if you and I have the same talent and the same thought and the same view of the world, one of us is not necessary, right? Just not necessary. And so that's problem number one. And problem number two is if I am you, I'm never going to work for you. I'm going to be doing it myself. So what you're really looking for is you're looking for a list of skills that amplify your skills, right? Or fill in a hole where you just have absolutely no skill set, no interest, no whatever. And understand that that person is going to be 70% of what you're looking for. And then the last mile is the processes and the procedures. So you're actually hiring B students that the system and the environment you put them in makes them look like an A plus, right? You're never looking for the 10. So people look for that 10 higher. No, look for a seven and the process makes them a 10. Mm. And that allows them to not only flourish within the organization, it also ensures that they can't be a 10 anywhere without you. Oh, that's so well said. So I'm curious, what is the profile of your favorite type of clients and what kind of situations bring you the most personal satisfaction um, in what you do? Yeah, I mean, there's something for me that is really just so satisfying when I meet somebody and they're like, listen, my life is good, you know, it's successful, right? They start saying, you know, I, I have all the things, you know, but you can feel that it's something's missing. Like you could just like the, the boxes are all checked, but there's something missing and it creates kind of a sense of loneliness. And through our work to see that person blossom, right? To see all of a sudden think connections being different, right? The aspects of, of business is different. Their relationships with their team is different. Their relationships in their personal lives are different. To see the substance and the depth build, there's something that changes in their face, their eyes, how they walk about, like everything about it, right? Because they usually come to me sad. You know, they come to me saying, wow, I'm such a good person. I do all these things in the world. Why do I feel like everybody's living and I'm not? <laughs> you know, like what's wrong with this picture, right? And so just being able to lighten, right, the individuals and help them really see how easy the scale is, right? To get from here to there, is much easier than you realize if you allow me to mirror, right? Because then there's a choice. Because I'm mirroring, here is what is needed to get there. So either change the there, or you have to change this. It's, it's the crossroads is, is so easy. And for most business people, because they're very analytical, right? Um, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the clarity to go, I need to do this to get that or change that to stay here. Yeah, either way, either way. And so I love my work. I, I love my work, especially since the resistance is so high when they meet me. They're like, nothing you're going to tell me. I'm like, oh, I'll tell you all the way down to your P&L without even looking at it where the bleeding is in the company. How long does it usually take to, to change a company or a, or a leader? It really depends on the leader themselves, mm -hmm. right? So some people say they are a people first initiative, mm -hmm. but it's a marketing tag. It's not actually them really believing that the people are the difference between this level and that level. But if the leader is like, listen, I know I need people to do this, right? And I know that I can't just turn through them, right? I know that it's going to require me to develop them. Right. So if I get that guy who says, I know something has to happen in the people world, we're already 50 percent of the way there. Then it's just the consistency. Right. So most CEOs already have a relationship with consistency. Right. right? Discipline. Oh, but right. their people don't. Right. So when I walk through an organization, right, I help a leader look to say, here's the clues of people who have no discipline in their life. Right. So how are we going to be disciplined? by putting in the systems and the tools, if not everybody is disciplined. So that's why we bring down the theme of the month. Mm -hmm. The theme of the month is to get them to what you already have in your life. Because if you're disciplined and I'm not, I've already created res resistance because you're like, I need you to do this, this, and this. And I'm like, well, sometimes I will, right? And so it's, it's being able to understand by looking at somebody, they're already telling you their relationship with discipline, consistency, 
ritual, right? They're telling you who they are. So if they're struggling and you're asking that of them, what is the chances you're going to get it? Zero, zero, right? So those are the things that I'm trying to work with in the company. So everybody builds the relationship, right? With these things, time, energy, focus, right? Freedom, all these things. Because the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. But I have to start with the fact that they don't have a relationship with it at all. And so everybody gets on the same page, right? And so that becomes the consistency that we're building based on the theme of the month. We're actually called behavior stacking, right? One good behavior on top of another behavior while removing the behaviors, right, that no longer serve the company. You talk about time a lot oh. and how valuable it is because that's all you have in life is mm -hmm. your time. Yeah. It's always a shocker. Yeah. <laughs> it's always a shocker when we do the time game. Yes, it sure yeah. is. Yeah. It sure is. Yeah. It's an so awakening, I, though. Yeah, explain to everyone what's the benefit of what you teach in time, and 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 it creates that sense of urgency and decision making and pulling the trigger, which I always encourage, um, especially in all different businesses in life. Understanding your time. Mm -hmm. Explain to everyone what time means to you and how do you teach it. Yeah. So you know, I think that time is the great equalizer, and it's the thing that we really don't want to look at. Right. So people will always say, oh, no, you know, I'm going to live longer. I'm going to do this. I'm biohacking. I'm like, OK, well, let's just use laws of averages, though. Right. Because, you know, business works on math. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you have to plan right for the worst, not the best. Right. Or your business will never work. Right. And so we have to say, OK, based on the statistics, what is the average? Just at, maybe I'm going to beat it, but what is the average? So that you can start getting a sense of how much time do you have left based on the average. And so we actually dial those weeks right, right up in front so that people can understand how many weeks they have statistically. And what that does, especially when you have um, younger people and seasoned people on the same team, you can understand why a young person who still has 3,000 some odd weeks and me who has 1,000 weeks, why is it they move so much slower to get something done? Because they have more life in front of them. Why do I have a sense of urgency? Because I have more life behind me. And so just that awareness by putting everybody's weeks up shows them their perspective, right? Our perspective changes as we get older because when you're young, you think you can do anything. You get all the time in the world. But then there's that tipping point where you realize like, wait a minute, right? And so with the younger people, because they have more life in front of them, the way that I lock in what time really means is I'm, I take it to their parents. I was like, how often do you see your mom and dad? Once a year, twice a year, three times a year. Okay based on how much time they statistically have left, what does that come down to? And it usually comes down to they have like 13 more visits, 20 more visits with their parents. And they're like, oh my God, Tw what? I'm like, yeah, that's all you have. That's all you have. And so it starts to give you this perspective of nothing is forever, right? I do a whole chapter in the book that says, what if you knew this was the last time? What if you knew this was the last time you were gonna wake, wake up next to your loved one in bed? Because things happen right? That not only people dying, but people get divorced. And you never know what that last time was. Would you have leaned into that last kiss, the last time you made love, the last time you were with your parents, that last dinner differently if you knew it was the last time? Because that's people's biggest regret is when they lose somebody. I was like, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to you know, be back next week. I thought there was going to be a Sunday dinner. You think right? There's going to be something else. And you don't realize that that next something else is, hey, I want to get divorced. And you're like, well, holy, sh that last night, I guess was it, right? You know, and you, it's that perspective of coming into full awareness that we only have a set amount of time. And so when people have monstrous goals, mm -hmm. I always say, is that monstrous goal in relationship to how much time you have left, how you want to spend that time? Because if your goal is to be a multi-billionaire, and you have whatever it is, X amount of weeks left, is 90% of your time, energy, and effort going to go at that goal, which means you're gonna trade life experiences to go for that goal? If it is, no problem, we can build that plan. 
But if the life experiences are those things that are in your heart's desires, saying, you know, I always wanted to, you know, walk the streets of Italy with, you know, have this memory, then you have to realize that, okay, for all of these things that are important to you, then this number has to come down because you have to trade right back and forth. And this is what allows somebody to get a very accurate playbook of what do you really want to do with your thousand weeks, really, truly. And then we back that up so that starting from today, every one of those, we call them areas of focus, are poured into every single day. And if you pour in every day to the thing that truly has meaning to you, then it always grows. You always hit those numbers, right? So that's what we do our prior, we do our areas of focus first. What's left over, we then go for like another goal or no whatever. But we start changing our relationship with time. And when you change your relationship with time, it automatically changes your relationship with money. Wow. Um, it was a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, that was incredible. I got to like digest that for a second. So your website mentions encouraging the creation of a new C-suite position, the mm -hmm. chief behavior officer, which you touched on. Yep. I think it's necessary. How, elaborate on more of like how you envision that role would do in a company um, and how many companies they are you aware of having one? Like, is this mm -hmm. something common? Is it growing? Yeah, it's definitely trend? growing. It's definitely it's definitely growing. Um, what kind of companies do you believe should have a full time chief behavioral officer? So, you know, and I'm going to generalize, right? Generally speaking, uh, a CEO of an organization, right, that's doing multiple millions of dollars, right, or hundreds of million, right, that that there's a tier where mm -hmm. it kind of that tipping point, that CEO has usually been very well trained in the tactical side of life, right? Structure, processes, procedures, negotiations, contracts, like a lot the tactical side. And a plan of tactics can only be implemented if you understand what the people plan is that the, that the tactics have to integrate through. And so the ideal role for a people officer is to work by the side of the C-suite so that when there is an initiative, the people officer would say, this is the tools, the methodology that people are going to need to understand what that outcome is and how they will resonate with it. Because not everybody in the organization is going to process the initiative the same way. And so if we're going to get to the place where we're saying, listen, people have to be part of the success plan, then you just don't need a tactical plan. You need a people plan as well, which means as, as skilled as you are on the tactics of life, I have to be skilled on the people side of it so that together we can do a better projection of what will and will not happen. What's realistic, what's not realistic. It's just like when we do mergers and acquisitions, right? I was like, okay, that looks great on paper. However, looking at these two teams that you're trying to bring together, here's where you're going to have the resistance, right? It's not going to take, right, 12 weeks to do it, right? This is what, and here's the aftermath of bringing these people together. And so the people officer is to deepen and strengthen the decision-making, but also timelines and budgets and the community, right? What people call culture, right? The community of what you're building, because the more your community doesn't have capacity, the more you are not going to hit your goal. You have to learn how to navigate people through strain and recovery, strain and recovery in order to sustain as a business. So the people officer role we've learned more and more is more important because we changed HR, right? HR used to be about people a hundred years ago and H HR now is just anti-lawsuit. That's what, that's what they're doing. That's where we're got in those positions right, now. Right. It's not about development of people. But when we looked at the Harvard Review and the Gallup poll, all the reports that came out at the end of last year, the number one reason why people were quitting or going into becoming entrepreneurs was because they felt that they were not valued and not part, not developed into something that was meaningful. Right? So that was the number one thing. No meaningful work, not no future development, don't see my, they, there's nothing, I don't see myself here. And so if I don't see myself working at your company and you can't talk to me about what would it look like if I spent a year here, three years, five years, 20 years, if I'm gonna give and share my unique ability with you, what does it look like for me? 
And that's all those things are the role of the people officers. And what we're committed to is creating the tools and the systems so that people officers and HR can actually excel in the development of people because your CEO doesn't have time to do that. If I have the CEO developing people, then who is setting the strategy and doing all that, right? The CEO needs to stay in his lane. And so this role is to amplify everything from the marketing to the sale, all of it, because people are part of every aspect of your business. So who's the best candidate to fill this role for companies? Because I'm sure that's a question people are asking. So is it the top HR person? Is it a marketing person? Who is that person that you can resonate with? Say, you are perfect to walk in this role and to be trained to develop into that role. So there's two aspects I think that is necessary in an ideal people role. One is the skills to understand what is the roles and responsibility of every C-suite position. I think this is where HR has gone wrong before is mm -hmm. because they really don't have experience in that role of what it, it looks like to be a CMO, a CIO, a CTO. Like what are those roles and what are the things that are within the role that can cause right the setback? Right? What do the budgets look like? What do the measurables look like? Why is that important to the other aspects of the, the business? So understanding how the C-suite right, contributes to the overarching goal of the company and understanding those measurables are really important for anybody in the people business, right? I understand every one of those roles and those metrics. At the same time, I understand how people come to the thoughts and conclusions that they do and where they get in their own way of getting to where they want to go. I understand how people create the resistance inside of the project or task. And so when I'm looking at what we're trying to do and the needs of the C-suite and how those measurables impact where we're all traveling, then aligning somebody's individual value drivers to align with the business value drivers by developing the skills that they need to close that gap and constantly seeing, hearing, rewarding them in their language for what's on their playbook, what matters to them, because they don't know how to get those things. So when a company just gives an individual a raise, why does their lifestyle not change? Because they have a bad relationship with money and money doesn't bring the life book to life. They don't know how to do that, right? And so it's closing the gaps so that the lifestyle continues to improve from the individual level while the value drivers of the company is also moving to the growth so that everything is developing. And so the ideal person understands how to use these behavioral tools and when, and how to then take those measurements of improving the people and how does that affect every single thing within the C-suite? You know, same thing when you're talking about marketing. Well, marketing is a communication to people, right? So understanding your true avatar, right? To be able to then speak to that avatar because that avatar speaks a certain way, believes a certain way, associates a certain way, but most people really don't understand what that is because a lot of times when I go into a company and I'm like, okay, here's the company's avatar. Would you be friends with them? Oh, no. Oh, see a problem with that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just absolutely. A problem. You know what I'm saying? And that's what's happening. It creates resistance because the person within the company actually doesn't like that person, but yet they're supposed to be contributing right to the, the content or whatever. And I'm like, why? Because you wouldn't be friends with that person. So you don't really know that person, right? You have your own viewpoint of it. And so it's tightened up all those areas in the business where things are disconnected, which means that the consumer experience feels disconnected. The employee experience feels disconnected. And then the C-suite is like, I don't know, I don't know why we're not moving at a better pace. And I'm like, I can point to those areas why. Right. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. On TV, you're the behavior guru like <laughs> Oprah and Steve Harvey yeah. and Dr. Phil. What's your favorite thing about doing appearances on TV? I mean, is it ever challenging for you to land nuanced points with a TV talk show format? Is My favorite thing, so this is why I love TV, right? Because especially TVs that actually have a live audience. Uh -huh. And so basically I can move you towards the actual desired direction in mm -hmm. about 11 minutes, Okay. right? So I love working at, on, on TV shows where, you know, there's, 
you know, people who are like, listen, I just can't get on the same page with my my child. I can't get on the same page with my spouse. I can't get on the same page with my my in-laws. Like when when people are struggling that they've already utilized every resource that they can think of and it's just still not working, it's a perfect opportunity for me then to mirror right? And then give them a game. I love our, we have so many games. And so when I give them the game, the game does the teaching, Mm. right? So then all of a sudden people are like, oh, wait a minute, hold on. I'm actually, this is, I'm like, here you go. That's what you're actually doing in this situation. But it allows them to see their own participation. The reason why we have conflict is because the belief system subconsciously is that you're the problem. So until I can mirror to see how I am contributing, you're never gonna get to resolve, right? And so that's what the games are for. So I like to take everyday people who have everyday struggles to be able to show them here is an immediate tool that you can do so that they understand that everything in their life that has resistance, there's a solution to. So just a solution, You just, just a skill, just a skill. You handle a lot of relationships, teaching, coaching, mentoring, different relationships. Mm -hmm. Take a uh, a romantic relationship as Mm -hmm. an example. What are the biggest challenges with relationships and romantic relationships that go on in the world that you see from all your experience? The biggest, biggest problem um, that I see in relationships is that they never set the third entity, right? So one partner sees life unfolding one way and the other partners sees the life folding an, another way and they never get on the page that says this is our desired lifestyle this is what it's going to look like this is what it's going to feel like this is what it, it, it the, the, the details the ingredients in it they never go through a detailed plan of what it is they're working towards and then to understand that that third entity is a little bit of you and a little bit of me that we both have to contribute to that third entity, which means I have to have skills on my side to contribute to creating where we're going. And you have to have skills, right, where you're contributing to where we're going. And we both have to feel good about what you're doing and what I'm doing, right? That's part of the trust. I trust that you're gonna continue to develop these skills that are adding to that third entity and vice versa. And so to be able to create the plan so that it isn't about you and me. I, you know, I'm not doing it for you. You're not doing it for me because that causes distance in a relationship. It started building bitter, angry, and resentful, right? Because I feel like you're my dad, right? I'm like, I have to report to you. Like, I'm not doing that, right? And the more, uh, talented an individual is, and the more somebody is independent, the less likely they're going to be told what to do. And so to remove that energy and unite that energy is to be able to say, well, what's the third, where are we going? Why are we going there? And what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? So that we're putting our energy towards the same lifestyle. So the reason why I behave the way I behave is because I'm committed to the lifestyle. It's not about you, it's about the lifestyle that we're working towards. And then to be able to revisit that, because things change, right? So, you know, for me, once a quarter, I sit down and I reevaluate that third entity plan, right? What has changed? You know, what has changed in my environment? What's, what's changed financially? What's changed about my influences? What's changed about the people? To be able to make sure that I always know where am I going? And we hear that when we, when we interview very successful people. One of the first things that they say is they have clarity in detail of the vision of where they're going but why we don't do it in our personal relationships. So, so many times when I'm working with a very successful business person, his wife has no idea of what the plan is. And then they work 20 years and then she's like, oh, but I don't like that plan, right? And everything blows up. There's nothing more expensive than disruption in a relationship in the you know ninth inning of building your business, right? So I try to secure relationships because the last thing a business needs is divorce right, to ensure to go, wait a minute, is there a way to unite, right, so that we can bring the commonality? And the only way to do that is understanding the two playbooks and then the United playbooks, and then how people contribute in order to be able to get that. And so many of us get into relationships where they're not really evaluating, right, the intentions and the skills of the other person. We already know that some of the most successful people in the world, right, have a power partner, right? They have that person that is working to achieve the same goals, 
right? No matter what the goals are, both people are working towards that goal, not that they're both working independently, right? Because then you've got two parallel lines that are in competition, mine versus yours, mine versus yours. And so nothing grows in that energy, just won't. And so the whole idea of marriage or a union is starting off on the wrong foot because we're still trying to use the ideals of 1950s where a guy and a girl got together, she did this, he did that, and it was kind of like an older model. Well, there's, there's nothing wrong with the model, but you have to improve it now because in most areas, especially areas of decent influence, it's not feasible to think that one person is going to bring down the half a million dollars it takes a year to be able to take care of the family and everything else that's required. So you're basically going, okay, well, you guys are all gonna live your life and you're gonna kill yourself. Well, that doesn't sound like a good plan. How do we both pull our resources to achieve the life we both want, right? And that's the power of partnerships, right? It's what we do in business, right? We sit down and go, okay, what are you gonna be as a partner? What am I gonna be a partner? What are you contributing? What am I, how are we both gonna get rewarded? Right, that's the same thing that has to happen in our personal life. What are we working towards? And what are we willing to say no to? And what are we willing to say yes to? So we're both designing that life that I inherently want. I actually, I don't want it because of you. I want it because I want it. And you want it because you want it. We push the ball in the right direction. So there's too many relationships that are so lopsided that I kind of go, so how do you think that's gonna work like long-term? Like that's interesting, but how is that going to sustain? How are you bringing that partner into your business, into your business meeting, into your networking? We all know how important networking is mm -hmm. and we've all been in a networking event where you go, well, that looks odd. <laughs> you know, I'm right. like, how's that gonna work, right. right? Because one of them can't talk because the minute they speak, you're like, well, that's, that's, that's a lot of work right there, right? It has to be a compatibility of, of unique skill sets that align with designing and getting the same life. And it's what you see every time. Like when I mean, you look at somebody and you're like, oh wow, they have such a great marriage. You realize that both of them are contributing. Both of them are consistently disciplined in self-development, right? The awareness, the hard conversations, auditing. Is life working? It's not working. Let's have a conversation. And so it's all about skill sets in order to be able to design anything that's valuable. That's great. So one of your hobbies is reading in your hammock. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what are some recent nonfiction books you like? Oh, I don't, you know, so I don't read a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm so right now I'm reading, um, uh, uh, oh my God, what's it called? It's uh, like Inside the Mind or something like that. So I'm, I'm always reading like psychology books. Um, you know, I'm dive, diving into those things. Um, I just finished um, the new book from Dan Hartley, right? So, that, so I'm, I'm just always, like I always have five or six books that I'm pillaring through at a time and I kind of pick up which ones. So I'm always having, I have them by my hammock, I have them by my night table, I have them downstairs, you know, by the breakfast nook. And so I'm constantly, so I don't read like beginning to end. Like I, I feel intrigued by something and then I start scavenging through different books to see their perspective on it. But I love, but maybe to a fault, like I, I and my business partners love to read too. So we're all like addicted. Um, uh, I can't keep up with Patricia. She's always like ahead of me by five books. I'm like, damn it, what do you, I haven't gotten there yet. You know, it's like, oh, right. And so I love to learn. My partners love to learn. Um, I think that, you know, one of the skills I was, I'm the most curious cat in the world. Like you can say anything and you're like, you know, how would you like to like, you know, jump in green slime? I'm like, I don't know, but that sounds so cool. Like I, I'm the girl who wants to do anything and everything. You want to jump on a plane? Yeah, let's do that. So, like, I am just curious about experiencing anything because I would rather say I had the experience. It doesn't matter if I like it or not. I just love the fact that I did it, right? I think that's why I climbed Kilimanjaro, like all those things. People are like, why in the world did you do it? I'm like, I just wanted to experience it. So I have a, a, a ferocious thing for knowledge, like knowledge, experience, why I like to travel. Um, so yes, I'm usually in my hammock with like, you know, a highlighter and folding thing, sticky notes everywhere, just going, oh man, that's awesome. Cause I want to be able to come back to it to just think on it. You know, I also hold, um, really good spaces of time of just thinking time. So as much as I take in information, I sit and really kind of contemplate on like, what did I just learn this week? And what does that all mean? And how does that, you know, change my perspective of myself, right? So after I've dove into a bunch of books, I then always sit and go, okay, what about me is going to be different? Now that I know this, what am I gonna do differently about myself? And that's where I can literally pinpoint how much I've grown over the last decade, because I'm constantly saying, oh, well now that I know, and I didn't know it before, 
here's how I'm going to implement and I'm going to make a change, right? And so that's, I think, one of people's biggest downfall is they're big note takers, but they don't create the space to put the notes into play, right? I would say the 1% better. Take one thing that you took a note on this week, just one thing, Mm -hmm. and implement it into your life. Give yourself the room, right, to implement it and always take a new thing and stack it on a current reliable behavior. So if you're like, hey, I always work out, like you work out no matter what, going to the gym is like automatic to you, then if you're gonna try to do something new, I'm going to stack that next to the behavior that's already ritual, Hmm. right? Because now you have a chance of that new behavior to succeed. Most people take a new behavior and they try to find an open spot on their calendar and put the new behavior where there's no ritual. And I'm like, not a chance in hell that's gonna work. You have to stack something new in between something that is consistent. And that's how you start building. So I'm always moving things around because I have a really good idea of who I want to become. Let's talk about routines because you kind of touched on it. Yeah. And you talk about 22 minutes in the morning, 22 minutes in the evening. I have a morning routine. I have an evening Mm -hmm. routine that Mm -hmm. I religiously do. Mm -hmm. Explain the concept of someone asked me, why 22 minutes? Mm -hmm. Why in the morning? Why in the evening? Explain that whole So your mind really looks at the way something begins and the way something ends. Mm -hmm. And so if you protect with everything that you've got, your morning, meaning that you just spent all night recovering, right? Restful sleep. Why in the world would you give that first morning impression to anything other than your intention, right? I say, I wake up and I choose happy. Most people, when they wake up, they touch their phone, which means you just gave the power of how you are going to feel to social media. Like whatever you got exposed to, your reaction to it is part of your belief of the day. And so you're trying to build an intention and choose how you want to feel about life. And so you've got to allow yourself that first 22 minutes to build your capacity for the day, right? So think about it as being a warrior, right? Mm -hmm. You would build your capacity to get ready to go out. And so 22 is a master builder number, right? So 11 is about leadership, 22 is about building. Well, your intention in the morning is to build, prepare for your day. Mm -hmm. And so in that building, you have to mentally prepare, physically prepare, and then spiritually align with what's the intention of today. What does today mean? so that you gather all of your intentions and you accomplish your intentions versus falling into your day by default. Most people fall by default. They touch their phone, they're erratic, there's no plan, there's no consistency, and they're just hoping that life works out. And so the number one thing that I say to people is please do not touch your, you're immediately giving away your power. So from the time you wake up to the time you touch phone, if that's four minutes, that means you have four minutes of capacity for today. How are you gonna fight a war with four minutes of capacity, mm. right? Instead of building your capacity. So those behaviors to remove that contact from reacting to whatever you see, same thing with people put on the news in the morning. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, that's who wants that energy that's in the morning, the right? Worst, that's it's the, the worst, worst thing, thing to do, do right? Yeah. And so it's intentional. It's intentionally of start bringing in your perfect day. So if your perfect day, if like water inspires you, but you don't live by the water, then in the morning, you wanna make sure that automatically, right, water machine turns on so that you hear water. It's starting you to groom to your day. You know, my practice is always gratitude. It's really important for me, right? What you don't value, you lose. You'll lose what you don't value. And so every day I sit and I make a list of things that I am so grateful are in my life, right? That I they energetically I'm connecting to those things because they're so important. I always set my intention for the day. I know that I need to mentally ground because my day is all about people and crisis and that type of thing. So I have to mentally ground myself to then say, do I choose my day? Am I mentally prepared to choose the day ahead of me? And I'm like, yes, I'm choosing today. And so it's constantly keeping me into building my capacity, but also keeping me in a position of power. Anything that is happening, I chose it. 
And if it's not working for me, I'm going to choose something differently. I'm going to pivot very quickly. And so those that alignment in the morning is really what allows you to present yourself as your best self. And the same thing in the evening routine. For me, because I spend so much time in the masculine energy, like my my most of my my clients are men. You know, most of the C-suite are, are men. Um, I'm in decision making. I'm in problem solving. Like I'm a lot in my masculine energy, which I'm very grateful that I have it but it's a small sliver of who I am. And so my evening is really protected to do the things that amplify my feminine energy because I need a counterbalance, right? I mean, this is all well and good, but who wants to cuddle with that, right? So I need the counterbalance. So my evening routine really has to be strict because I do the things that make me feel more like a girl, right? So I have a really goofy part of my personality that's just weird um and so that's where you know i'm like you know playing the dog or you know i'm dancing around in my living room and i love to clean and organize so you know my kids be like what are you doing now i'm like i wanted to pull the furniture out of here and see what it like oh you know like some i'm always doing something girly and so i you know i I dress for bed so that i'm out of my work clothes and i feel more feminine and i usually have candles going but i really like to lean into the opposite energy because I spend so much time in that. And so if you don't practice, you know, your relationship with your feminine, that when you actually need it, it's not as developed as the other side. And so in my personal life, um, although I'm, you know, highly skilled and very productive, there's a lot of my personal life that it's not my masculine energy that I'm leading with because, you know, my counterbalance is I want to be able to play against somebody else's masculine energy. So if they're in the problem solving thing, then I want to be able to create the entertainment around that problem solving, right? I want to be able to go, look, we can do it like this. You know, And so that's the thing that you have to be able to realize, how do you identify? And I think that a lot of times one side of us is so underdeveloped that when we're trying to build intimacy, we don't have it developed to play with. And we're hoping that our partner just fills in that blank, which I always think is funny when I'm talking to somebody, I'm like, so you want somebody to be intimate without you. (laughs) Isn't that not what intimacy is, right? So if I have the capacity and I have the opening to be intimate, but you haven't developed that side, so I can't get to you, even though I want to, if there's no space for me, how, how am I going to reach you? And so this is where men and women get confused that both people have to create the space and the intention and then the environment in order to have intimacy. As you create it, the more you create it, the more you can then hint to it throughout the day, right? Those become the things that only you and I understand, that nobody else understands, but you and I understand what's going on, which is keeping the intimacy fed, Mm -hmm. right? And so just like anything else, what you don't value, you lose. You know, intimacy, which is so important for us as beings, needs to be constantly nourished, right? Well, it gets nourished differently from the feminine energy than it does from the masculine energy. And so that's the game. But this whole thing of life is a game and we just have to learn how to play it. Oh, that's so well said. So the name of the show is I Own It. It's owning every aspect of your life, which you do. I try, yeah. Well, can you share a recent example where you could look at and say, I didn't, only, I didn't, only, I didn't own it fully mm. and you had it all wrong? Yeah, I mean... Oh, you know, there's there's so many of those, you know, I think when you realize that you're not owning something, it's the biggest ouch moments that you have in life, Mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, you could have showed up better. So I will definitely say, you know, in the, you know, the passing of my ex, um, you know, I've relived that a thousand and one times to say, is there something that I could have done differently? You know, could I have leaned into that situation? Um, And so, you know, I, I really took like literally, you know, months of, of, of silence really to just understand that experience of, you know, when somebody commits suicide, it gives you an opportunity to really try to go, what could I have done? Even though I know that's a, a personal choice, but how did I contribute to the emotions they were feeling in order to go all the way to that decision, right? There's there's all these interactions that stack up within somebody, right? And so it's like, well, how did I contribute to the stack? So I would definitely say that, you know, I could have owned my side of those experiences way more present. And a lot of times when 
I know I, like, you know, especially I'm a processor at night. I know I could have shown up better or I instinctually know I disappointed you or, um, you know, I decided to cancel, but I know it was really important to you. You know, those type of things I could have wrapped back and acknowledged, right? Especially being a behaviorist. I could have said, hey, listen, I know you were really excited about yesterday. Um, and you know, I had a need to cancel, but I just want to make sure that I acknowledge how important it was and how much I appreciate you created that space for us, right? There's more that could have been said that went unsaid. And so, you know, since Anthony's passing, I have really been very intentional about how do I communicate and speak the words that I just think, you know, to make sure that they actually they're spoken, even if you know them to give and honor the communication that you actually know. Well, it's the same thing too, like giving the gift that, you know, I was so, you, you know, you gave me this beautiful gift. It was really important, important for me to overly communicate to you how much it meant to me, right? And how excited I was, like what now, how am I going to put it into play? Instead of just saying, okay, well, thank you. Or that was a really nice gift. I wanted to say, not only am I excited about it, A, it's my first one. So I'm like, hey, and I'm gonna wear it tomorrow home, right? To really take the time to give you all of those details so that I actually imprint my gratitude instead of being sloppy with it. And so I think that that's what I really didn't own is I didn't realize how much my energy impacts others, mm. right? That my responsibility, like I'm a, I'm a big force, right? And so the absence of me is, it's, it's aware. And so a lot of times that causes pain and I don't realize that, you know, something as simple as me not, not attending or not coming or doing whatever. And so I'm trying to take more accountability of my role in the responsibility just because this is who I am. So that's how I haven't owned it, but I'm going to get better. <laughs> All right. What's the best way for people to follow you? Like what's, is there a website is, you know, social media, how do people engage with you? Yeah. Well, we, I, I love for people to go to designing genius okay. because it showcases what we actually, how we serve others. And okay. so I'm always uh, looking at comments and, and, and when people reach out to us, cause I'm curious about how people, are curious about people so always my curiosity uh, definitely can reach me on the social channels again just amelia mm -hmm. you can find me on twitter it's just at amelia and on instagram it's amelia underscore antonetti um, and i love that i, I like look, look at the comments right i like to say what people are you know i agree or i disagree or that's interesting or tell me more so i'm definitely paying attention to the social streams because i'm really committed to teaching people about behavior like why it matters to everything so that's please so, reach out that's to That's fantastic. So we're going to wrap up with our three questions. Are you ready? Oh, God. <laughs> All right. Here we go. All right. Okay. So you, I'm not even going to say your age, but I know how old you are. Uh -huh. So go back. Uh, Older than dirt. Okay. Yes. Okay. Go back about 40 years okay. to when you're 16. Mm -hmm. And now you are this sophisticated, intelligent, successful woman. You can go back to when you're 16 years old. Mm hmm what would you share with your six-year-old self that, you know, you're, you're laying on a couch and you're able to free associate and speak to yourself. What do you tell your six-year-old self with all the knowledge and experience you have right now to help that person become who you want to be? I mean, I think if I was talking to my 16 year old self, you know, um, I came out of such a messed up childhood, um, that, at the age of 16, you know, I really was like, I just don't think I can do this forever. Like it just, I just can't, it can't hurt like this forever. And so I think I would go back to my 16 year old self and say, I know that your environment has told you that the monsters are out there mm -hmm. to realize that the monster is here, mm. that the greatest monster that I've ever faced was in my childhood. It's never been out there. And so I think it would, it would help that 16 year old girl not go out into the world so timidly, so afraid, um, so um, protected, you know, mm -hmm. so defensive. You know, I spent, I would say most of my, you know, teens and in, in, in early 20s, because I was, I had custody of my younger brothers, um, so defensive because I thought the monster was out there. I was waiting, right? To, you know, and I didn't realize that the monster was my childhood and everything got better from that. And so I think that it would give me such a sense of relief to know that it was going to get better. So it's our last day on earth. 
God forbid. Yeah. Okay. It's just me and you, kid. That'd be good, though. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'm cooking. <laughs> whoa, hold on. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Slow down. Right? We got to slow down. It's our last meal together. Mm -hmm. Your choice. What are we eating and what are we drinking? Hmm. So I am Italian through and through. So okay. definitely it's going to be some incredible bottle of wine. Oh. Um, 100% will be wine and definitely red. Um, All right. And then uh, as far as eating, um, you know, I have a, a very wide palette of foods because I've traveled so much. So um, I definitely love anything that comes out of the water. If it comes out of the water, I'm, I'm full game. Okay. Um, and I love vegetables, you know, uh -huh. so like I love artichokes and I love, uh, you, you know, uh, eggplant and Brussels sprouts, like anything, anything. Else. So it's going to be like some lively looking, you know, cool salad with stuff on it because I like all the stuff and then seafood for sure. And then just pairing with just great wine because the wine just dances on your tongue. And so something like that. And then dessert. <laughs> okay. What do we do for dessert? Um, uh, you know, I don't know. I, you know, God, I'm such a, I'm such a cook, you know, desserts. I always kind of like that tangy tart kind of thing, okay. you know, so I'm not really a chocolate girl, but I love, again, I like sensations. Uh -huh. So I love, that's why I love wine. I love right. how it feels in my mouth and, and what happens, all the tingly of my body. I love sweet and sour because I love the way it dances. Mm -hmm. You know, I like sweet with salty. Like, so I like the mixing of flavors because again, I'm an overgrown child. Right. So I'm always like, oh my God, taste this. This is so cool. Try with this one, you know? So those type of things. I would definitely create an entire experience of food that is mixed sensations, right? To really kind of experience this with that kind of thing. Yeah, for, for sure. So as you can see in our studio, we have a grand piano, drum it's set, so cool, electric, right? yeah. and acoustic yeah. guitars. Yeah. Behind me is a black door. Yeah. Okay. You could have any band or musician walk through that black door. Mm. They could be living or deceased. Mm. Your choice. Who would you have walk into this studio with us and play us a song? And what song would they play us? I am crazy about Queen. Okay. I've always been. I mean, fantastic. Anything from Queen, uh -huh. I think I can fly. I literally okay. think I could jump off a building and fly. I listen to it before I take stages. I listen to there anything from them. Um, I just think I, I think I'm superhuman, and okay. so um, definitely that would hands down. And what song are they playing us? Um, God, you know, Freddie can play the the, I know, the right? piano. It's incredible. I I mean, I like anything from Queen, like anything at all. I mean, from you know that bottom girl. I mean, all I like all of it. I, all right, anything. pick one. We only get oh, one. Oh my God! I mean, I, I guess uh, you know, I guess their their most iconic one, right? Because um, it has both the music and then it kind of has the ballad at the end. You know, plus it was a great movie too. So I mean, you know, I guess you know we are the cha you know that champ that whole that whole song. I guess would be incredible to be able to have to witness his performance. Something I never never saw them in concert. But I think yeah, I think him. I think just being able to get into his creative mind okay. so before his time. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Amelia Antone, thank you so much for joining us today. What thank a pleasure. You. If you are interested in listening to more episodes like this to drop this type of knowledge around the world. Drop, kick that right hand button and click subscribe. Feel free to click the like buttons as much as you can because as we say in the ether, let it go viral. To follow me, go to benreinberg.com. Follow me on all the different social media platforms and feel free to log on to my company's website, alliancecgc.com. We are the leader in commercial real estate investing. And for our brand new fund, we just launched the Alliance Medical Property Fund. Feel free, free to click on that fund and you can invest passively as well, just like I do, to build wealth and a legacy for you and your family. Amelia Antony, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. And we hope to see you soon. Always. Thank you for listening to the I Own It podcast with Ben Reinberg. To hear our past episodes and connect with Ben, visit benreinberg.com.